Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. Nah, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah, thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. Well, good morning. I hope you guys enjoyed that opening video. I'm sure that many of you moms can. I know that my mom certainly can. And speaking of my mom, I just wanted to take a minute to reach out and say Happy Mother's Day. Mom, I just wanted to thank you for all your support and your love and your prayers and your patience over the years. And forgiveness was probably a big part of that too. And so I just wanted to say thank you for all of those things. They have certainly helped shape who I am today. So Mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day. This past Wednesday night, uh, we had the privilege of having a trivia night hosted by Ryan McMullen. He did a super job organizing some really funny categories, real fun competition, lots of laughs during the night. And so uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Ryan for organizing that. And we're looking forward to, to a rematch sometime soon in the future. And I hope that many more of you guys get to join in on that. Uh, you don't want to miss the next one, that's for sure. If you, have driven, if you haven't driven by the church this week or read your copy of Did You Know, you may not know what has gone on here in the church parking lot. On the north side of the building, I think it's the north side. I'm pretty directionally impaired, but I'm pretty sure that's the north side. Uh, Terry Weatherby and his crew came in, and they did some grading and some reshaping, and they brought in some gravel and the graders and excavators, all those things. And um, they've increased the parking lot size on that side of the building by 40%. Uh, so when we are actually able to get back together, Together and, and have church here at 15 Elm Street, we'll be looking forward to having lots of place to park a whole bunch of new people. So we're just really appreciative of Terry Weatherby and his crew for getting that done and uh, look forward to being able to fill that place with cars real soon. Elders, just wanted to let you know that we have a Zoom meeting on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. That's our regular monthly meeting. Please have your minutes read over before uh, that meeting starts. That just helps us to be a little bit more efficient throughout the night. Also, on Wednesday night at 8, we're hoping to have a Zoom meeting with our search committee. Um, that search committee continues to look for a youth pastor. We're hoping to have that guy in place by September. And so please be praying for us and for wisdom in hiring the right person. At this point, I want to call our three ushers forward. That is Mr. Laptop, Mr. iPhone, and Mr. Android Phone. And uh, we would like to take up our morning tithes and offerings. Um, again, giving is very simple. You can just go to the Church Center app or log on to the People's Church Truro website and uh, just click the Give Here tab. And it's pretty self-explanatory, really easy to do. I want to thank you for your support. Also, if you're not comfortable giving electronically, just uh, put some cash in, the, in your church envelope or in a check, whatever, and drop that through the mail slot at the church and we'll make sure that that gets to bill really want to say thank you for your continued support of the ministry here we're able to get some projects done we're able to be creative in in ministry and so we really do appreciate your financial support 
Speaking of creativity, I just wanted to let you know that we have hired Jesse Smith for the summer, and uh, she started on Tuesday, and she's already connected with some of our teens. Uh, she's done uh, she done an interview with Heidi Wall via uh, Zoom, and she's edited that video, put it onto the Reach page for Thursday Night Testimony Night. Uh, she has filmed uh, two intro videos for our junior church program, which you'll be able to see there on our church services page. Uh, we've put her to work, and she's working really hard and really excited to see that what we can do to reach teens and kids uh, uh, during this time of isolation and things, and, and Jesse's just going to help us uh, really increase our ministry potential in those areas. So we're excited to have her on. Again, just give her a shout out of encouragement. Uh, we really appreciate all that she's done for the church over the past many summers that she has worked here. And then finally, before you go today, I would really appreciate it, and the church staff here would really appreciate it, if you pop back over to the church website and filled out a connection card. It doesn't take you very long. I know you're super busy in quarantine, uh, but if you wouldn't mind just dropping back over to the church, uh, or to the church website. Finally, uh, before you go, one thing that I would ask you to do is if you wouldn't mind popping back over to the church website, and the link there is in the description below on our YouTube channel. Um, if you just pop back over to the church site uh, website, we would really like it if you filled out an online connection card. You know, it just helps us know who's watching, where you're watching from. Uh, also, it gives us a chance to uh, pray for you if you have a prayer request, or you can pop us a note of encouragement. Uh, we really do appreciate when people fill those out, and um, if you wouldn't mind taking the time, we would certainly appreciate that. Hope you have a super day. Again, happy Mother's Day. God bless. We'll see you next week. Good morning and welcome. I hope your week was good. I hope you slept well last night, that your family is gathered, that breakfast was delicious, and welcome to the rest of you as well. I want to welcome those who struggled through the week, endured illness, disability, found the hospital or the care home breakfast, to be less than desirable and you feel distance from a family member or from your entire family. Welcome. We're glad for everybody to be here today. And today is Mother's Day. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to my own mom. No boy ever had a better mom and our family's blessed to have you. So thank you mom and to my mother-in-law in Prince Edward Island as well. A great lady and a great mother-in-law. I just had a mom tell me this past week that in the last two months her sons have become more attentive than ever. They stop by, they sit outside her window, or they put up chairs in the driveway so that they can sit at distance from one another, but they call regularly and she feels truly blessed. Happy Mother's Day to all of you moms. And as we have traditionally done, we want you to know that following the service, there will be flowers for all of you, flashlights for everybody, and Timbits in the foyer, I wish. Would you join me as we ask God for his presence and his blessing on our time together in his word today? Father, thank you for this new day. Thank you for your mercy and your grace today. Thank you for the gift of your son, the Lord Jesus, and the salvation that he purchased with his precious shed blood. Thank you for moms, all of them. Some feel fantastic and some feel like failures, but we give you thanks for every one. Thank you for all our political leaders. What a trying time to be in leadership. Lord, help them, bless them. May they turn to you for salvation, for wisdom, for strength. Thank you for our police force, our medical workers, our labor force, for grocery store shelves that are stocked and trucks that keep rolling. And thank you, Father, for caring for us so completely. We commit to you those who hurt and those who mourn great loss. May they turn their eyes upon Jesus to find hope and comfort and consolation in him. And Lord, we think of our missionary family. Be pleased to bless each one in their service and surrender today. And Lord, we look into the scriptures this morning. As we do, we would be so pleased to have you meet with us and to bless your word to our lives. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, indeed, because it's Mother's Day, I've decided to hit pause on our study of the Gospel of Mark just for one week. By the way, a lady told me this past week that one of the best things about online service is the ability to hit pause on the pastor. Well, that, ouch, what else can I say? But nowhere in the scriptures is more attention given to the subject of parenting than in the story of Samuel's parents, Hannah and Elkanah. We meet them in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah's name means grace, and I'm going to emphasize grace throughout this message this morning, grace in this story. 
She first appears as a woman who has no children. And then she becomes the mother of one of the greatest boys and greatest men that ever lived, and his name was Samuel. Her story is set in the period of the judges. At that time, there was no king in Israel, no leader. It was a time of turmoil and confusion. They were depraved morally. Their religion had grown cold, and a great leader was needed. With the death of Samson, the Philistines were gathered around the edges of the country, ready to come in. The priesthood was corrupt with its own moral scandals. And worst of all, the word from the Lord was rare. God wasn't speaking in those days. The nation was in desperate need. And God used a woman, the woman that we're going to be talking about, to bring to this life and to this world a great man to lead the people of God. Samuel was indeed the product of God's work And God used a godly mom and a godly dad to do that work. They gave to their nation and to their world a tremendous legacy, a man of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Now there was a certain man, his name was Elkanah, and I'm going to skip through a lot of things there and say simply that he was an Ephraimite. He had two wives, the name of one Hannah and of the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, there are three things I want to emphasize this morning. Remember, we're being gracious. Number one, they had a great human relationship. Hannah and her husband, Elkanah. Let me state right now that there are godly single people. There are godly divorced people. There are godly single parents. But because we're looking at God's pattern this morning and the most human relationship or the most important human relationship in raising godly children is that of a mother and father, I want to emphasize the relationship between this mom and dad. What you communicate to your children in this relationship dominates their thinking. They're learning about human relationships from the two of you, about virtue, sin, love, forgiveness, sympathy, understanding, compassion, and integrity. They're watching. And what you have with your spouse is projected to your child and through your child to some degree. Would someone pick my wife up and... Oh, forget it. Blew that whole paragraph. Okay. They're learning about virtue, sin, love, forgiveness, sympathy, understanding, compassion, and integrity. They're watching. And what you have with your spouse is projected to your child. So at the very outset of the Word of God, it's clear that the relationship between Hannah and Elkanah was a good one. Now having mentioned that, remember we're emphasizing grace. It wasn't a perfect one. How many expect the ideal and anticipate the perfect when they anticipate a Christian marriage? And yet they grieve its absence in their own relationship. This man was married to two women. He was not a perfect man. And let's start by realizing you're not married to a perfect man either. Now, would someone pick up my wife and splash some cold water on her face, please? Thank you. Okay, now we can go on. Let me break that down for you. If your husband's gone, he wasn't perfect. If he's still here, he isn't perfect. If he's on the horizon, he won't be perfect. If he lived in your dreams, that's the only place he was ever perfect. Unless you add two little words. To me. He's perfect to me. She's perfect to me. Someone once said, men are like parking spaces. All the good ones are taken and those that are left are handicapped. Well, that's not fair, and it's not true. All men are handicapped. By the way, in this age of equality, let me add that all women are handicapped too. I want you to understand that Hannah was married to a polygamist. I can guess how that would sit with any woman, and it didn't sit any better with Hannah. She had a rival in her home, another wife in the house. And worst of all, that rival was producing the boys and girls that she wished she could have. She's feeling very much the unfruitful, unproductive wife who cannot give her husband that which her heart most longs to give. 
But thinking about her husband, he wasn't a perfect man. This was a primitive time. Polygamy was part of human culture, but it was never God's design. God designed one man and one woman to leave their parents and join together for life and become one flesh. But this society was rampant with polygamy. So Elkanah created a very difficult situation for his wife, Hannah. Now, we don't know the details. It may have been that he married Penina later because of the need to pass on his inheritance and he had no children from Hannah. And that would make the pain deeper because Penina came to do what Hannah had failed to do, and thus she felt like a failure. It's not a perfect relationship, but it's a good one. Why? For a couple of reasons. Number one, they shared their worship. They worshiped God together. Verse 3 says this, This man, this is Elkanah, went up to his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. It's his habit. He went every year. Deuteronomy 16 explains, verse 16, Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. Every man, verse 17, shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord. Three times a year the men went. Hannah had a husband who went faithfully to worship. He was a worshiping man. He offered his sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3 notes that the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there. Now, if you know that story, you know that they were corrupt men. But unlike them, Elkanah had a godly husband, a true worshiper. He was not perfect. Yes, he was a polygamist. Yes, this was a violation of God's law. And yes, it brought negative consequences. It produced pain and heartache. And they had that in their family. And Penina, the second wife, rubbed it in and emphasized it. But here was a man who believed in God and worshipped him. So, emphasizing grace, this lady had a husband who believed. Let me encourage you, young ladies. When you date, date a guy who loves the Lord Jesus. Date a guy who honors the Lord Jesus in every area of his life. And when you get married, marry a guy who loves the Lord Jesus and honors him. And young men, I encourage you to do the same. Date and marry only one who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't just listen to their words. Look at their lives. Put them to the test. Do they put Jesus Christ first, ahead of their passions, ahead of their possessions? Do they live out his word? Do they genuinely reflect the character of Christ daily? So Hannah, emphasizing grace, had a godly husband, a spiritual leader. And they worshiped together. Your worship is vital in projecting godliness to your children. When God established the law for his people, Deuteronomy 7, 1, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out the nations before you, verse 3, you shall not make marriages with them. And then he gives the reasons why. They will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Joshua repeats that injunction, chapter 23, verse 11. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Those passages present the principle of marrying a godly man or a godly woman. Now, thanks be to God, by His grace, He can and He does often overrule in those situations. It may be that when you were married, you weren't a Christian, and you've been drawn to Christ since. The scripture does not tell you to leave your husband. It may be that you married an unbeliever willfully, knowing what you were doing, and God in His grace can overrule in those circumstances. But for the sake of His purposes and for the plans that He's laid for us, the godly should marry the godly for the sake of His glory and the next generation. And this lady, by the name of Hannah, had a godly husband. And they shared worship. Let me ask you, are you faithful in your worship? Are you faithful to meet with God's people weekly? Are you faithful to meet with God in His Word daily? Maybe we should even say, are you faithful to pray and talk to Him hourly? Are you faithful to live what you say you believe? Your spiritual devotion on a daily basis is communicating to your children a message they will never forget. 
they shared worship. The second reason they had a great human relationship, Elkanah and Hannah, is that they shared love. 1 Samuel 1.4 says, Whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina his wife and all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. The implication is he didn't love Penina. Did you read that in there? Penina was there because she could produce children. Penina was there to create a future for his inheritance. But he loved Hannah and he made no attempt to hide that. When they offered their sacrifices on the altar, the priest would take a small portion and the most of it would come back to the family and that evening they'd have a feast. And as he was passing out the food at the feast, he would give a double portion to Hannah because he loved her. She had his heart. It showed in his kindness, in his thoughtfulness, in his sacrifice and honor for her. A wife's security is found in her husband's love for her, not in his bank account, not in a fancy home or furniture. She finds her security in his love, and it needs to be demonstrated, and frequently so. The husband finds his security in knowing that he has his wife's respect. There's enough adversity knocking him down daily and making him feel inadequate. He needs to know, dear wife, that you respect him. And that's the way it was with Elkanah and Hannah. He took the time to demonstrate his love in private and public ways. And in spite of that love, he had another wife. You wouldn't like that one bit? Neither did she. Interesting, isn't it, how God balances things. Hannah had love. Penina had children. God, God was gracious to all of them. They shared love. They shared worship. They shared love. And thirdly, finally, in their great relationship, they shared feelings. Verse 6, and her rival, that's Penina, and she's listed as her rival. Her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed the womb. Twice it states that the Lord had closed her womb. This isn't Hannah's problem. This is not Elkanah's, the husband's problem. This is the Lord's doing. And yet Penina would harass her, stick the knife in and twist it. It happened year after year as they went to the house of the Lord. She provoked Hannah so that Hannah wept and wouldn't eat. She goes to the big feast. Elkanah, her husband, loves her, gives her the double portion, and she can't eat a thing. And Elkanah can't understand. Oh, husbands, can you relate to that? Her husband said to her in verse 8, why do you weep? Why aren't you eating? Why is your heart so grieved? And then I think he said something he regretted for the rest of his life. Am I not better to you than ten sons? Oh, I've thought those things and said those things. It's such a male answer. But he said it because he loved her, because he cared enough to ask how she was doing. And by doing that, he indicated that he shared feelings with her. He cared how she felt. He read her feelings and he asked a question. Why, Hannah? Why? We husbands can be very insensitive and quick to give answers without hearing questions. I'm guilty. We're guilty. But Elkanah knew the conflict was intensified by Penina. He knew it was deep and painful. He knew it was a hard place for his wife to be. He was tender, sympathetic, and thoughtful, and he felt her sorrow. They had a deep human relationship. The second main point of this message is they had a right heavenly relationship. They were cor correct in their relationship with God. There were things right between she and her husband, no statement of conflict in that union, but there were things that were great between she or them and the Lord. Let's emphasize her side of things. Number one, she had a passion for God's blessing. Sometimes we think about that selfishly, but she wanted her life to be blessed of God, to be pleasing to Him, to know His favor. She wanted a child. She wanted a child so much she wept and fasted. What a great way to ask God. Her heart was broken over the fact she had no child. She did not have selfish motives. She didn't want to live out all of her own unfulfilled fantasies. She didn't want to fulfill a need for love. She already had that. She wanted a child for one reason, 
to give him to God. God does not call all people to be married, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He gives some the gift of singleness. And there are times when for God's own purposes, He does not give children. But parenting is a gift. Children are an inheritance from the Lord, and it is God who opens the womb. She desired a child and wanted to honor and glorify God with her child. And what I'm saying to you is that truly godly parents are not reluctant parents. Oh, all of us know reluctance in a day. I can remember the first time my wife told me that we were expecting. I was so upset. I thought life as I know it is over. My wife as I know her will never be the same. And we will be so tied down and, and it's just going to be awful. That was selfish and immature of me. Instead, it has been wonderful. We do not find children to be an intrusion. We do not usually find the child's schedule to crowd our own so that we have no life. But sometimes it does. Godly parents are to see a child as a gift from God, as a special blessing of his love, as a hope for the next generation. She was not asking to be a mother on a whim, but it was an act of faith. She had a passion for the Lord's blessing. Secondly, she was characterized by prayer. She knew where to go with her heartache. So in verse 9, Hannah, after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, perhaps she'd eaten a little. Maybe she ate while the others ate. Uh, we're not told. But she went to where Eli the priest was. He was sitting on his seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she goes there, verse 10, she's in bitterness of soul and she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. She's crushed. And she makes a promise, a vow. O oh Lord, she goes on to say in her vow. But notice this, she's a woman of prayer. She understood that God was the source of the blessing she wanted, that God alone could alter her situation. In verse 12, it says, it happened as she continued praying before the Lord. Continued. It was constant, an ongoing thing. She remained, she stayed, she poured out her heart, repeatedly depended on God. She was characterized by prayer. She's characterized by promise. Verse 11, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction. And by the way, she saw childlessness as an affliction to her. The affliction of your maidservant, and remember me. And not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I'll give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head. Now that last little part was a Nazarite vow described in Numbers 6. If a Jew wanted to take a vow of total consecration to God, he would not cut his hair. No concern for his physical appearance. He would not drink wine and strong drink. That means he would abstain from the parties and banquets and celebrations. He would live a life of grave, consecrated, God-centered honor. Many Jews took a Nazarite vow for a short time, but three in the scriptures were lifelong. Samson was one who didn't always fulfill it. John the Baptist and Samuel all their lives to be totally devoted, consecrated to God. No personal indulgences, no preoccupation with fashion or the world around them. And so she promised God, I'll give you this child. I just want to raise a godly son and give him back to your glory. This was her promise to present her little boy to the Lord. By the way, there are many people, married and single, parents or not, who get involved in the lives of young people and the purposes of God in raising them. Many children who are not their own, they serve, and we salute all who serve in this way. We're very grateful for those who work with them in nursery programs, in children's programs, in teen programs, in schools as teachers, in Christian schools as teachers, in Bible schools and so on. God bless you for your contribution to the children of others. And number four, she was characterized by purity. Now, let me just put it bluntly. Eli was a lousy high priest. Verse 12 says, It happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. 
Do you have a family member or are you guilty of it yourself when you're watching TV, when you're preoccupied or, or lost in your thoughts, listening to someone else, that your mouth moves in somebody else's words? I used to sit beside my grandfather while he watched hockey. You could get a black eye and he wasn't even in the game. He kicked the puck in, he elbowed everybody in the room, but he was content and intent upon the game. This priest sat there in the doorway watching her pouring out her heart and weeping and crying. And verse 13, Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. Now that's quite a commentary on the situation in Israel. The priest, seeing a person this lost and preoccupied in prayer, would determine she was drunk rather than deeply in prayer. And Eli said, how long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. And she said, no, my Lord. I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Don't consider your handmaiden a wicked woman. Don't consider me like that. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken. And Eli, hearing such a reasoned answer, said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition, which you've asked of him. He mistook her for being drunk. Don't think your maidservant a worthless woman. Don't think I'm in that group. I'm not that kind of person. She was a woman characterized by purity. And number five, in her relationship with God, she had patient faith. Verse 18, she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Why? Because she had given her huge problem to God and left it there. She wasn't going to remain frustrated. She walked away trusting. And that's a mark of a godly mother, one who casts the burden of her family on God and walks away. She eats and is no longer sad. And then one other thing, chapter 2 and verse 1, Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile and on it goes. I rejoice. Why? She's praising God for his goodness to her. She had a right relationship with God. Now there's a third point. Just briefly, let me mention it. She had a right home relationship. Look at verse 21. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. He's into his routine. He's a faithful guy. Three times a year to Shiloh. He gathers the whole household. Up they go. And verse 22 says, Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, not till the child is weaned. She's going to miss out on some of the things that have been part of their routine because she's dedicated to her child. Now, wait a minute. That's a couple of years, maybe three years. I don't know exactly how long little Hannah stayed with, or Hannah stayed with little Samuel, but several years, surely. I'm not going. It's probably a two-week trip. Travel there, a week there, travel back. Verse 19 says this, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Husband and wife worshipping in the morning. Beautiful. And they returned and came to the house of Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. This name Samuel means heard by God. This child that Hannah bore was a child of her passionate cry to God. A child of her vow, and I will not forsake my time with this child. Oh, mom, you're probably painfully aware how quickly the time goes, is going, or has gone with your child. By the way, when we get older, we realize how quickly the time goes with our moms and how desperately we want to take advantage of time with that precious lady who gave us birth and gave us life. And some of you aren't able to get to your moms because of distance and because of the things that are going on right now. Maybe your mom's in a senior home and you're unable to go in and physically touch her or be in the same room. And our hearts go out to you in that. But how precious is time with mom? A fellow by the name of John Stiles wrote this poem. 
I have worshipped in churches and chapels. I've prayed in the busy street. I've sought my God and found him where the waves of the ocean beat. I have knelt in the silent forest in the shade of some ancient tree. But the dearest of all my altars was at my mother's knee. I've listened to God in his temple and have caught his voice in the crowd. I've heard him speak where the breakers were booming long and loud. Where the winds played soft in the treetops, my God has talked to me, but I've heard him ever clear when at my mother's knee. The things in my life that are worthy were born on my mother's breast and breathed into mine by the wonder of her love, her life expressed. The years that have brought me to manhood have taken her far from me, but memory keeps me from straying too far from my mother's knee. God, make, the, make me the man of her vision and purge me of selfishness. God, keep me true to her standards and help me to live to bless. God, hallow the holy impress of the days that used to be and keep me a pilgrim forever to the shrine at my mother's knee. Do you have a mom like that? Such was the testimony of Samuel in the years that Hannah dedicated herself to him as a little boy. Elkanah, verse 23, her husband said to her, Do what seems best to you. I love that. A husband who trusted his wife and trusted her wisdom. He wanted her to go. She said no. And he said, All right, do what seems best to you. That's great. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let me caution you. Let the Lord establish his word. Don't back up on your vows. So the woman stayed and nursed her son till she had weaned him. And then at the end of verse 22, she said, I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. What a gift that must have been. She dedicated that child to God. Verse 27, for this child I prayed, the Lord has granted me my petition. Therefore, I've also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And they worshiped the Lord there. What a scene. She sought nothing from him. She gave her precious child to God. Never, though, did she drop her responsibility for him. Chapter 2 and verse 19 says, His mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. And they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. But meanwhile, Samuel grew before the Lord. She never took him back. Dedicated to the Lord, and that was his life. But she never let go of her responsibility. Every time she came, a new little robe. A godly mother never stops. Her apron strings are never completely untied. Godly parenting is never over. You never stop loving and caring and longing for your sons and daughters, no matter how old they are. You pray for them and you urge God to reach into their hearts and lives and pull them to himself. Moms, ladies... Let me permit, uh, permit me, please, to ask you, do you want to be a godly mom? Are you preparing to be a godly mom? Are you preparing young women, other young women, to be godly moms? And are you honoring your mom, whether she's godly or not? Do you honor her? If God has given you godly parents, he's given you one of the greatest gifts this life will ever know. No, they're not perfect, neither one of them. But when they love the Lord Jesus Christ and when they've tried their best to pass that on to you, they've given you the greatest gift they could ever give. Take it, own it, pass it on. Thank you, moms. For the moms who raised us up, gave us hope, and made us strong. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who had to figure out how to do this on their own. For those who never got called mom, 
but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the hurting moms, who've loved and lost, but never given up. For the praying moms, who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the working moms, the stay-home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms. For taking care of us, when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For teaching us how to walk, and how to make a difference. For the late night snuggles, and the early morning pancakes. For sitting with us after our first breakup. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you. We thank you.